Hello, and welcome to a special session of the JCI series, Conversations with Giants in Medicine. I'm your host, Ushma Neal. Today, we shift our format and partner with graduate students from the Gerstner Sloan Kettering Graduate School, who have launched a series called The Roots of Change, Conversations About Women's Empowerment. The first hour of this conversation with feminist icon and activist Gloria Steinem is available on the MSK website. In today's episode for Conversations with Giants in Medicine, graduate students Ines Fernandez Maestra and Yan Yang Chen will interview Dr. Vivian Tabar and Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn. Dr. Tabar is the chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering, as well as an eminent stem cell biologist focusing on the development of human embryonic stem cell derived dopaminergic neurons for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, as well as other cell based therapies for the repair of brain injuries. Dr. Blackburn is the former president of Salk Institute after having served a long career on the faculty of the University of California, Berkeley and the University of California, San Francisco. She is best known for her scientific work on telomeres and for her discovery of telomerase she shared in the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Thank you both for being here with us today. It is, I, I said it already many times to you, but it's a huge honor. So we can start with our first question. Um, both of you, yes, like Jan Jan and myself, uh, were born and raised outside the US. Uh, can you start by telling us where and how you were brought up and what you were like as children? Um, was there anything or anyone that influenced you to become a scientist and a physician scientist? Why don't we start with you, Dr. Blackburn? Sure, thank you. And thank you so much for having me on this panel and uh, for the great privilege of having the chance to listen to your interview with Gloria Steinem, who was a huge influence on me as, a, as I grew up um, and became a young, a young adult. But I think you were asking about earlier. So I, I grew up in Tasmania, which about is about as remote as you can be almost. Uh, if Australia seems remote enough to some people and Tasmania is an island, a state off the southern part of Australia and even more remote. So I, I always had the sense I was in a remote part of the world. So a lot of my worldview came from, from reading. And, uh, and, and I realized quite quickly that the, the wide world that came from reading since TV wasn't, it wasn't a big feature of our lives until I got a little bit older. Um, the wide world, that was what was sort of what stimulated my interest and, and, and my imagination. And, and frankly, I found it a lot more interesting, I guess, in many ways than my immediate surroundings, which were um, you know, rather sort of smallish town, typical suburban almost, uh, or not that different, I think, from some parts of the United States. And so, um, I, I, I just was stimulated by being able to read and realize what the world was around me. And um, I grew up in a big family. My, my mom and my dad were both family physicians. I was one of seven. And, and I think that it was interesting because it didn't make me feel I had to go out and make friends because there was always my brothers and sisters. There was always companionship. So I never had to make an effort. So I could just read and do things that I was interested in. And I realized that I was really different from a lot of my friends. I, I really cared about, you know, nature and animals, and uh, and you know, in some ways, our family was different from a, from many of our friends. So I sort of realized pretty early. I think it was kind of kind of up to me to be doing what I, um, you know, the way I thought. I was different, and that was okay. And um, having a mother who was a family physician too also just made me think that there was no, no other way that a woman would have a life except being in a job as well as having you know, a family or a homemaker role. When I was in middle school, it's the biography that was written by, by her daughter, Eve Curie, and uh, not the daughter who became a scientist herself, but the other daughter. And, and it's, uh, it just captured me because it was about a, a scientist and, and sort of encouraged me to think science is a wonderfully interesting thing, but also it was about a person, a mother. And, uh, and I didn't realize from that biography, the tribulations that she had gone through as a woman in science, because the biography wasn't, wasn't about that. 
uh, probably lucky I didn't read it at that point, but it really captivated me that science was this wonderful thing. And, and also she was, she was a mother and, and all sorts of fascinating stories about her as, as a mother as well. And, uh, but it was really the science that I just thought this is somehow a really interesting and sort of worthwhile thing to be doing because I was already interested in nature and science just seemed to me a part of that kind of interest. I suppose my uh, growing up was a bit atypical. I, I grew up in Beirut, Lebanon, and uh, at a time when uh, violence and survival anxiety were really the prevalent um, sentiment. I was just about old enough to recognize a sense of loss when the war started, uh, loss of all the good things, if you will. And so um, that situation creates in you, a, you know, difficulty in visualizing the future because you're really living day by day. That includes your schooling, your tests. There was very high chance that your exam the next day would be canceled because there'll be bombing, et cetera. And so it was, quite turbulent, but I was, um, it kind of drove me to read a lot, to create sort of, uh, I had this sort of tunnel vision that never left me, that I'm capable of just concentrating on listening to music and reading. And I had an intense curiosity about how living creatures were made and function. I remember I received a gift of a microscope when I was 10 or 11 years old and I looked at pond water forever, paramecia and things of that nature. I never really imagined that I would or could be a scientist or a physician, but uh, my father was great inspiration. He believed in me fully, despite the circumstances and was extremely supportive. I was delighted to hear uh, Dr. Blackburn speak about Madame Curie because she also was an incredible influence uh, to me, an inspiration. Not only, as she said, this is a woman who obtained two Nobel Prizes herself, whose own daughter received a Nobel Prize, who was a single mom after Pierre Curie died, raising two daughters, both of whom successful. She also was a nonconformist in every other way. Not only did she have to fight for lab space. She was also, um, you know, literally harassed for having, uh, for falling in love with a, an unhappily married man. There were people at her door screaming and yelling and embarrassing her uh, about her own private life, but she was also a great humanist. She drove around in her van with a primitive x-ray machine to take uh, radiographs of soldiers during World War I, saving many lives. And so she, she's this bigger than life figure who also was intensely honest and uh, someone of great integrity who sort of spoke to me ever since I was maybe 11 or 12 years old. Would you say that those terrors of war uh, made you reflect on a better future and get more inspiration, you know, in books and perhaps that led you to science and the purpose of science to make life better? Yeah, I would say uh, there is a sense of you, you develop as a young person, um, this sort of urge to see justice happen. And science was particularly attractive because it was a form of universal truth that sort of transcends all of this. Uh, but also in practical terms, I literally had to leave the country if I wanted to uh, obtain any sort of further education or, or career. And so that was a really major decision that I took on after my medical studies, uh, landing in the US where, you know, many people opened doors for me and facilitated uh, my, uh, my career. In your scientific careers that lead to uh, your leadership positions um, right now. So within the, that journey, especially in the early part of your careers, do you experience and there any gender bias that challenged you and how you sort of overcomes that? So I'm, I'm a neurosurgeon. That is a male um, specialty. I was never taught or mentored by a woman. Um, it was incredibly difficult to get into that field. Um, already the, you know, uh, women who were born and educated in, in the U.S. 
had it had a challenging time getting into that, let alone a, an immigrant woman. So that was already a long, arduous journey to um, that I had to get through to obtain the training. And then there's uh, after this, I have to say, long training of almost 10 years after medical school to get all that in and do some postdoctoral studies. Then comes the next almost decade where you're really starting to assert your independence as a physician and starting to build your lab. And at the same time, your biological clock is ticking and you have to have your two, in my case, my two children. And so this was a time of great um, excitement, but also, uh, I would say, great turmoil. Um, and, you know, it's dynamic, so the children grow, uh, things improve in your own sort of journey on knowing yourself, where you lie, your strengths, your weaknesses. And then comes another phase of sort of after getting into that phase where you're more confident and clearer about your goals, that you never lose the anxiety about being able to do, to juggle all these things. Um, the path to becoming, for example, department chair was was one largely of uh, sort of an individual and a personal journey of feeling that I've reached a point where I am very excited about supporting others, about building, innovating um, with, with fresh talent and be the engine behind that talent where you sort of are willing to be in the background, if you will. But uh, there were numerous challenges that had to do with gender bias. Um, uh, both in, in my case, I'm older than you, there were macro aggressions, which have now morphed into micro aggressions, perhaps. Uh, but there were, you know, um, true obstacles um, in, in the way. I'm happy to say are a lot better now, albeit not completely gone. Well, first of all, I, I can't help being amazed at how much Dr. Tabar's experiences, all the way from the microscope in the pond life as a child to uh, what you were just saying now, how much parallels there are. Uh, I don't know, did you just choose us so that because you thought that we were twins? Because <laughs> <laughs> there's, so, there's, there's so, many, so many things that I recognized. And now I don't need to say some of the things that I, I was going to say, because Dr. Dubar has said them so well in the last couple of questions. But let me just begin by, um, you know, paths toward leadership positions. And, and you, know, you know, since you're more interested in, or you are interested in the uh, younger ones, you know, it was really important that I, I had both encouragement from teachers. I, I did go to an all-girls school, which had certain advantages to it, even though there was a track for women who wanted to become secretaries or whose school thought they should become secretaries, which was sort of amazing to me. But um, but there was also one where you didn't have to uh, do that. Uh, so I didn't learn to type for a very long time. <laughs> but uh, there, there were teachers who encouraged me and said I, I had abilities. And, and, and yet there was also a counterbalance to that too. And I remember so well, well, a, a teacher from another school, not, not a teacher of mine, who once actually said to me when I confided my interest in going into science and said, what's a nice girl like you doing going into science? Couldn't believe it, but it had the advantage that it made me really mad. Uh, I didn't know how to express that at the time. So that was something that um, was, was uh, my path toward leadership went from not knowing how to express things to feeling comfortable in, yes, I can express things when I feel that something is just not right about how a woman or a young scientist or a fellow scientist, you know, is, is, being, is being treated. Um, what I especially started noticing was that um, when I said something, either in a group of people or around a table, it sort of wouldn't be heard, but then a male colleague would say the same thing and, and it would be heard. And, and so, and I wouldn't know how to deal with that at that time. Now, I, th I think there are strategies and, and one of them is you, you say, well, you know, you, you say, I'm so glad you agreed with, with what I just said or, or what I said or something like that. So you sort of show, yes, you said it first, but you also are saying, yes, you're also supporting me in this. Um, so trying to be a leader as uh, a woman, uh, I think Dr. Tabo said, Tabo said it really, really well. You have challenges. And so 
there are certain things that I, you know, just learned to try to focus on. And, and that was in terms of the leadership roles. Well, let's, let's try and think of where the power is, is not going, uh, because you're usually operating in a male, oper a male dominated environment where, where all the power was and, and is. And so I would be thinking, well, what can, what can I do? And so, so I, would, I would let it be known, for example, if there was something where there was some resource, you know, whether it's a funding entity or nominations for positions or scholarships or you know, fellowships, I would either point out in the nominating pool how few women and minorities there were, or if it was well represented, which more and more luckily does happen, I would also point out, look, this is a good nomination pool, making sure that that was in the set of considerations that were going to be used on top of what are all often in my field, the very conventional kind of ones of, you know, what constitutes good science. And for many in my arenas that historically you know was quite a limited style of a certain kind of science done by certain um you know powerful groups in well-traveled grooves based on conventional comfortable views what did it look like not to mention who was doing the science what did they look like so uh all of those things i think were things that i started to get more and more confident in expressing and uh, that has, I'm so happy that, that has been the trend as, as well. Earlier on in my career, I have to say, um, I think uh, Dr. Tabar used the phrase tunnel vision. I never thought of it quite that way, but I, I did use a sort of, um, let's say, strategic um, denial, <laughs> which was that I just wanted to do what I could do really well because I recognized in that world, that was going to be the route in which I could be, uh, you know, successful. And being successful to me actually really just meant doing more of what I loved to do, which was science and and, so, and more and more supporting uh, my women colleagues and more and more, uh, I think as a leader, uh, as a research group leader through one's life, that's a sort of leadership really supporting your women trainees who very often would undervalue their abilities compared with those of their male colleagues who were in comparable situations. And it was over and over again, uh, my women trainees who undervalued whether they had the ability to, you know, to succeed in science or to, you know, get that paper published or, and so forth. So that I realized was a very important part uh, uh, all the way through my career. I needed to make sure that this, you know, started at home, so to speak. That And, and speaking of home, that you could have a family. I have one child and um, now grown up, I, you know, that, that you could have a family and it didn't spell the end of you as a serious scientist. Well, thank you so much for both for sharing. And it's interesting that the common theme is that you both mentioned that at some point you learned and then really um, have the feeling comfortable and really have the confidence and feeling that you both can, can do this. And then I'm kind of just wondering, like, uh, when um, do you feel like you have this, um, you feel like um, this gain, this level of confi uh, confidence, and then I roughly like at which point of your career that you feel comfortable like facing these um obviously it's an ever growing uh like a thing but then is there like a moment you feel like oh i can do this now that's previously kind of seems challenging to you getting yeah. tenure was very helpful because uh it kind of gave me a freedom and and a sort of i was terribly nervous about getting tenure at the uc university of california at berkeley and at one point you know the procedure had gone on and then i hadn't heard anything and so i sort of figured okay well i've just got to go and start job hunting so i sort of stomped into the acting chairman's office and said, okay, well, I, I guess I better start looking for new jobs now. And he sort of looked at me, you know, totally unconscious that I might have actually been worried about this and said, oh, oh, no, no, no you know, I tell him fine, it's just sort of sitting on some desk in the university hierarchy. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, honestly, I thought I had failed. And um, so it was very helpful to me to know, yes, I'd actually got tenure 
it also made me braver in my science because I thought a wonderful illusion. Oh, now I can do all the science I want to do and no one's going to you know, be able to do anything to me. Hello, it's called grants and getting support. So you have to keep proving yourself in science all the way along. But I remember in my career, that was, that was a helpful one. But the other really important one was much more relevant to you as, as trainees was that um, I remember my postdoctoral mentor at some point when I was in the process of applying for jobs and so forth. And I had no idea what he thought of me. I thought he maybe thought I was a bit of a kind of, I don't know, you know, I didn't know what he thought about me particularly, you know, and, and he said, he said, he said, you know, you're a first class scientist. And I just thought, wow, you know, I had no idea he thought that. So it's really important to your trainees to tell them that they have abilities because we don't know. And I think, especially as women, I can speak personally, I judged myself very, very harshly by some, you know, weird high set of standards. Maybe I was afraid to fail. I, I don't know what it was, but I, I certainly didn't have a lot of confidence. And mentors can be so helpful in, in you know, and you can be realistic too, right? If somebody is not cut out to be a certain science, but was somehow railroaded into doing science and you feel they're unhappy, um, that's okay, you can be supportive. I had a wonderful technician who wanted to, um, who, who was going to be a graduate um, PhD program person and was doing a technician job for a couple of years and got more and more unhappy as the time to apply came because everyone said, oh, you absolutely have to go to graduate school. She actually wanted to be a winemaker. And so everybody said, yes, you should just be a winemaker. So she's a wonderful winemaker now in Washington state. You know, um, it's okay to uh, tell people that it's okay not to have the abilities and wish to do science. I agree with what was just said. I, I think confidence is also dynamic. I think there are um, milestones in a career, becoming a professor or uh, getting a particular grant or whatever it is that can provide that, but you really have to be receptive. And one of my pet peeves is sort of the preponderance of lack of confidence among women scientists and trainees. Um, I find that they speak less, they speak up less. You have to really push them to speak up, be it in a lab meeting, be it to come up to you and say, well, I want to go present at this or that meeting. And, in, and sometimes they surprise me because it, I get the impression that they thought that I did not want them to go to this meeting when in fact, I just wasn't on my radar and they haven't really sought the opportunity. I mean, if you want to be successful in science, the first step is for you to accept that you are going to be a scientist and to that it is a challenging career and you have to be passionate for it in order to succeed. And then it's your mentor's job to support you further, to provide uh, the, the nudges of, of confidence that uh, Dr. Blackburn is talking to us about. But it is, a, it is really problematic, I think. This imposter syndrome is true. I, you see it in all professional women, politicians, physicians, scientists. And um, I see it in my young daughter who grew up in a household that supported her every step of the way and who, you know, has to be, we set sometimes these impossible standards of perfection that we don't accept um, any performance to be below that. We don't want to hear ourselves speak or ask a question unless we're 100% sure. We don't want to take risks often in, in public, in front of colleagues. And that perpetuates a cycle of sort of withdrawal and uh, at the same time, not asking for rights. You know, my days, the uh, rights were, wait a minute, there's no place to nurse my child at, at, this, uh, at this place. There's not even curtains on my door if I want to do it. Um, I was shown the bathroom to say, oh, well, here's a place where you can do it. Uh, you know, um, you ask for it, you get it. Not always, but at least we need to do our part. And then, of course, there are other, you know, you, you are up against mentalities, a, a whole network of bias that you have to conquer. 
uh, sometimes in, in personally, individually, one bit at a time, sometimes communally, and all the way up to changing things all the way to the top so they can reach uh, other women. Um, and you have to accept some days you're going to be more confident than others. It's not, um, I don't think the two of you, for example, should look to me, I'll speak for myself and say, well, you goes a confident woman. I don't wake up very confident about everything every day, that's for sure. Um, and I do second guess myself. I just um, push myself to speak up and to deal with the consequences. It's uh, quite all right to do that, but to also be prepared at all times uh, as much as possible. So that's why I mean by sort of a, it's a dynamic state of affairs, confidence, but you've got to nurture it. And, and can I add to that, to nurture it, something that I, I was very slow in learning is how important it is to be seeking out people who support you. I think I was lucky because people supported me and I often hadn't necessarily asked for it or even known that I should have asked for it. Uh, but I think that you as you know younger trainees scientists in the making physicians in the making it's really important to actively seek out people who will give you support and and that can take all sorts of forms it doesn't have to be one person and by the way a lot of mentors fail yes we know they should be supported but they aren't so don't rely on that if you don't have a supportive mentor uh you know there's various things you could do I mean, short of changing your mentor, which is not beyond possibilities, and that's something you should think about. But if you can possibly, and not if you should, find ways that you can find people to support you in all sorts of different arenas. Maybe it'll be people who are young parents like you, who can talk to you about how you juggle all the various things about having you know, a family and um, a career. There's actually a lot of good tricks of the trade people have learned, by the way, and, and they can really help you about how you use your time very well, how you think about using your time. That was one kind of help that was tremendously helpful as I you know, was being a professor and a full-time scientist and, and, and a mother. And the other kinds of things are, you know, how do you go about the whole business of, you know, the next stages in your career presentations. Ask people to listen to you give your presentation. If they haven't already volunteered, find them. Find people who you can share your, you know, insecurities with who are not going to be threatening to you or who might undermine your career because of they, you know, you feel they know things about you that you are uncomfortable about telling them that might be seen to compromise. Find people you trust, but actively seek them out. I was not good at that. And as I said, I made my life, my life more difficult. And I don't think it helped particularly success, you know, be successful. Although, you know, I had a, a determination to, to do well because I loved what I was doing. We know that both of you, right, um, have worn and still wear many hats, um, lab PIs, uh, lab leadership roles, clinical duties, and both of you are mothers. So how do you have it all? And do you think this is, a, this is only a question for women? Well, we don't have it all. We earn it. We earn it. We work for it. Um, you know, this is really the sort of juggling. It's, it's an exercise in management of what is really an unstable system. So first, you want it all. That's the most important thing. And then you go get it. Does that mean it's easy? No, not at all. But you know, it, you come into this field, we should come into this field prepared to, um, I'm, I sometimes find myself repeating this, people get bored with me saying that, but you have to be the CEO of your own life. Um, you can't really be training to be a neurosurgeon, being on call for 24 hours every third day, have a not very supportive partner or no partner and raise a child to the standards that you would like. It would be good to, to organize life a little bit. Uh, so perhaps you don't quote, have it all, all at the same time. Or, you know, when I was raising my children, I simply, I mean, I'm, I'm a woman born in, in, the, in the Middle East. You should imagine, try to imagine what it looks like to read something that Gloria Steinem wrote when you're living in a country where you're mostly valued for your looks 
and you're not very far from the Phoenician goddesses who were valued for their fertility. So, uh, it, you know, you, you have to, rec you recognize from the get-go that nothing about this is, is simple and you arm yourself with everything that works for you, asking for help, being prepared and, uh, and being smart about how you manage your anxieties. And, uh, you know, I had um, somebody told me one day, just in the elevator, waiting for the elevator together, just conversation went to uh, my child or, you know, I got to run home for this or that. And she said, you know, children are very resilient. And it, just, it was like a revelation to me. Like, yes, your child will survive if you're a little bit late or if you can't really make it to the school play. But at the same time, I organized my schedule. I asked my assistant to plug in my children's school play, et cetera. And I made up for the time, but I selected a school next door, even though the much better school was, you know, was accessible, but a lot further out because I knew I would have to. So you have to be pragmatic. And uh, yes, we don't have it, we earn it, we go get it. And so, so can you, and you just need to know what it is you want and, and fight for it. it. It does get a little bit tiresome to always fight for it, which is where the communal spirit comes so that I don't, you don't have to fight for the same things that I have to fight for, but we shouldn't fool ourselves. I mean, there's a Simone de Beauvoir, sort of the Gloria Steinem in, in, in Europe is known to have said, um, that women's rights are never fully guaranteed, that it suffices to, for the world to have a, an economic crisis, a religious crisis, a political crisis for those rights to be lost. And that's what's happening in our country now, slowly but surely, some of these rights are being revised. Uh, similarly in academia, if we do not continue, maintain the, excuse me, the push for women to be successful and remain successful, we're going to go backward. In fact, this current um, great movement for hiring more diversity, promoting uh, diversity among scientists, physicians, et cetera, is exciting. I'm seeing more people actually making steps to not just talk the talk, but to actually hire and promote someone. But I am concerned because we have not yet evolved our system to nurture these hirings and guarantee their success. We should hire for success. And that success would look different if you were born in Africa and started your career there or in, in remote corners of Australia or the Middle East, and you come into a system where there's just one cookie cutter of what good science looks like, what a good scientist looks like. We can't hire people because they're diverse and then say sink or swim. Here you are in our system, see what you can do. We have to have the courage to change things around to fit that person's needs because we believe in their talent. And once they are successful, then we can say that we have really acted upon the promise of uh, promoting diversity. I think Dr. Tavar has just said it so well. And I can, I can kind of add perhaps some sort of pragmatic kinds of things, which is you're saying, well, you know, wearing many hats. So how, how, do, how do you do this? And sometimes people turn the question into a different phrase and say, well, how do you have balance in my life? And, and, my, and, you're, you know, and I say, well, you know, at any one moment, there's not balance. So you are intently doing something that you care about. So, so when, I, when our son was born, I realized, well, a lot of things that I was doing before I really had to stop and think what was most important. And I decided, okay, what was important to me? It was family and work and work and family. That's what mattered to me. So I just thought, well, what can I, what, what can I cut out? And I didn't think of this myself. I, I had a, a wonderful friend, an executive in a professional society. And she said, well, I just cut out, because she had a family. I cut out things like shopping, because in those days you couldn't shop online. Uh, uh, and I just make sure that the time I do spend with my family is really worthwhile time. And so I realized, yeah, I could, I could, I could miss out going to movies that before I thought was, oh, it's really important go, going to movies and plays. So I just stopped doing that until, until our son grew up. Well, I saw some pretty lousy children's movies, I have to say. And then what about eating out? No, I just said, look, I can go to lunch with anybody, seminar speakers, whatever, but I'm not going to dinner. Dinner is with my family. And uh, 
you, you could just say, look, these are the things that matter. Now, there will be times when your work is making you spend much more time with your work than your family. And as Dr. Tabau said, that's, that's okay. You know, I was a, one of seven children, my mom worked. I mean, it wasn't like she had to be with us every single second telling us what to do and so forth and organizing our time. We had to organize our own time. We did just fine, all seven of us. Uh, but you, you really can think about what's important and do that. And then there are times when family is really important. People have dependents who are not only younger, but often older dependents. There are times when you just need to be spending time with them too. Work sits back and waits for that, but it has to sometimes. And you have to be assertive in saying, look, this is important. And I think, thank goodness, there's now much, much more of an understanding, you know, broadly that that's okay to do. It was very hard for professional women to do without feeling that they were being devalued as professions, professionals. And I'm happy to say that's easier to do, to say, look, my family is, is a priority now. And so, you know, life moves on. Now I'm Professor Emerita. I can do things now that are important to me that I didn't have time to do before. So I almost think balance takes place over long periods of time sometimes, and not in this way that people think of, oh, I want to live a balanced life, but somehow to think every week is balanced. No, it probably won't be. And I think being able to be intense in things that matter to you is, is valuable. And if they're professional things, I think your family members learn from that as well, that what you do is as important to you and the family as, you know, spending nominal time with them. So the final question is as follows. Um, what career path do you think you will have taken if you were not what you are now? I would have loved to be a pianist, a classical pianist. I'm just not good enough, I think, that. I started a bit too late. And I used to have this fantasy that the best job in the world might be that of a writer. But I, you know, fast forward, a very successful writer who just works for <laughs> themselves without any bosses, a little bit what Gloria Steinem talked about, no hierarchy and just uh, be in full control. But those are the fantasies. I'm very happy being a physician scientist. I told you Dr. Tabar and I were chosen because we're twins. The pianist thing was exactly what I was going to say. Oh. And, 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 and I was lousy enough to and luckily self-aware enough to realize that I wasn't good enough. And this would have been a very, a very short career, shall we say. <laughs> so um, now, now when I think about science, I kind of wish, you know, if time had moved and I was shifted to a different time frame, perhaps I would be a neuroscientist because I'm so fascinated by the, the enormous challenge that our human brain and therefore our whole entities present to us. It's interesting to see so many similarities between the two of you. So thank you so much for being on the conversation today. It's a wonderful hour. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much.